medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. Today we're going to talk about how some of your thoughts may actually be killing you. It's not about thoughts of eating this turkey or anything else that you can see on this table. What we're going to talk about is a little different than what we normally talk about on MedCram. We're not going to be talking about nutrition, diet, although we have talked about that before. Nutrition, sleep, rest, exercise, air, water, sunlight, avoiding toxins. What we're going to talk about is something that most people that you listen to in terms of optimizing health aren't really going to talk about that much, what it is that we're actually thinking about. A lot of times people think thoughts that we have are just kind of out of our control, but actually that's been proven to be false. We can actually control that. And who better to introduce this to us but William Shakespeare himself. He writes this in Julius Caesar, Act 3, Scene 2, that famous tragedy and he really brings up a truism here in this quote when Mark Anthony addresses the crowd after Julius Caesar has been killed. He says, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I've come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. And so what he's saying here is a truism, which is that we rarely remember the good things that people do, but rather the evil things that live after them. And that's the stuff that we focus on. And really, it begs the question, does your mental approach to life affect your body, your immune system, and your health? And I think you'll be surprised at what the research is showing. And we always stick to the research here at MedCram. What does the data show? You may be asking first, who is MedCram? I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt. I'm board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary critical care, and sleep medicine, and also the co-founder of medcram.com, where we explain medicine clearly. We have hours and hours of medical videos where we explain topics. We also have continuing medical education. Our videos are used by publishing companies and medical schools and other professional schools alike to educate. Let's get to the topic here at hand. For that, we'll look at this article that was published in 2016, and the title was Optimism and Cause-Specific Mortality, a Prospective Cohort Study. So here they were looking at a number of patients, and this was actually the nurse's health study, so these were primarily women, and yes, men can be nurses as well, but this is what they called it back then. And they basically looked at a number of things. They say here that growing evidence has linked positive psychological attributes like optimism to a lower risk of poor health outcomes, especially cardiovascular disease. It's been demonstrated in randomized trials that optimism can be learned. So this is a thought process that you can actually learn to do. If associations between optimism and broader health outcomes are established, it may lead to novel interventions that can improve public health and longevity. In this study of 70,000, so this is not a small study, they looked at dispositional optimism in 2004, and then they looked at all cause and cause specific mortality rates from 2006 to 2012, and they used a number of different hazard models. In an association, they found that women in the highest quartile of optimism was associated with the best health outcomes, and specifically mortality. With a 95% confidence interval of between 0.66 and 0.76, they found an average of 0.71. So folks, that's like a 30% reduction in all-cause mortality. Even after they added health behaviors that could be associated with this, health conditions, depression attenuated, but did not eliminate the association. So still even there, there was a 9% reduction in that. So associations were maintained for various causes of death, including cancer, heart disease, stroke, respiratory disease, and infection. Given that optimism was associated with numerous causes of mortality, it may provide a valuable target for new research on strategies to improve health. But wait a minute. Association does not necessarily mean causation. So it could very well be that there's a third factor that's not only improving optimism, but also the mortality here. What we really need is a randomized controlled trial. Enter a randomized controlled trial. So this was one that was published back in 2016 titled, Does Gratitude Writing Improve the Mental Health of Psychotherapy Clients? Evidence from a randomized controlled trial. So randomized controlled trials get rid of the confounders. And so you can say here that randomized controlled trials, if they show that it works, that is by definition causation because you're eliminating the confounding variable. So this was done on the campus of Indiana University. 
These were actually students who were seeking psychotherapy. The majority of these were women. I think it was like 60 to 70 percent were women in this case. And it was 293 adults, so a fairly sizable study, not huge. The median age was 22 years of age. And again, they were seeking psychotherapy at either a counseling center or a community-based training center at Indiana University. So what they did was they randomized these students to three different groups. The first group was just psychotherapy only. So this is the control group. Hey, they're signing up for psychotherapy. They're going to get psychotherapy. But the other two groups were interesting. So the second group was psychotherapy plus expressive writing about stress experiences. So essentially, they're reliving their stressful experiences and putting it down on paper. This is kind of like the evil lives after them, according to Shakespeare. But the next part is the good and tear it with their bones, because here they had psychotherapy plus something called gratitude writing. This is where they write a letter to somebody in their past that they have gratitude to because they did something for them or they felt that there was a connection. And they would write a letter each week for three weeks. So this is just three letters that they're writing. And they looked at these three groups in a number of different ways. After four to 12 week follow up, so four weeks after they had written their letters, what was the result? Well, they found this group here, the psychotherapy plus gratitude writing, had significantly better mental health than either of these two groups here. In fact, these two groups were pretty much the same. So let's take a look at the data here. We have time one, time two, time three, time four. We've got the gratitude writing and then everybody else, the expressive writing and the control. And if you notice here at four and 12 weeks, let me tell you how to interpret these scores. 2.78 on a scale of zero to four with this GMH scale is the cutoff between clinical anxiety and stress versus non-clinical anxiety and stress. Four is the best. That's the place you want to be. So as the number goes up, that's good. 2.78 is the clinical cutoff. So below 2.78 is not good. And you can see here before they were randomized, 2.31 versus 2.24 in the gratitude writing group. And then notice what happened. Everybody goes up because they're all getting psychotherapy, so we would expect them to go up. But the gratitude writing people went up faster and higher. And in fact, here by week number four, the gratitude writing group actually had passed the clinical cutoff, whereas the expressive writing and control had not. And you can even see here that the gratitude writing was the highest towards the end. In the gratitude writing, there was more positive emotions than there was in the expressive writing. There was less negative emotions than there was in the expressive writing. And there were more what they call we words, so inclusiveness, incorporation, than there was in the expressive writing. And they found that the difference between these two groups was statistically significant. You can see here 0 0.03 and essentially 0 0.03 as well in both of those conditions. So what did they find? I'll give you the link to their website. They found four things that were really interesting. Number one is that gratitude unshackles us from toxic emotions. The gratitude group used more positive words, right? That's no surprise. And it did not correlate with better outcomes. What was actually tied to better outcomes was the use of less negative words. So in other words, it could be that the positive words were distracting you from remembering toxic negative experiences that you would have. One thing that they drew from that was don't ruminate on negative experiences. We're going to come back to that at the end of this when we talk about things like empathy and forgiveness, because those are really powerful concepts to understand if you really want to have good health. Number two, gratitude helps even if you don't share it. So what was interesting is, is that the people that wrote the gratitude letters, only 23% actually shared the letter. But in everybody who wrote the letter, they all had a benefit. It seems as though distracting you from remembering negative things will work even if you don't share the letter. Now, you could share the letter, but you didn't have to. They didn't know whether or not sharing it or not sharing it actually made people better because the study was not powered enough to actually see that difference. So that's what they found, that gratitude helps even if you don't share it. Number three, gratitude benefits takes time. So they did not notice a statistical significant difference in the first two time periods. It was only when they got to 4 and 12 weeks that there was a statistically significant difference. When you do this sort of activity, don't feel like even after a week, if you're not noticing anything, that it's not working because it may be working. It just takes about a month or two or three to get it there. So then they did some follow-up studies on this, and they actually did something called functional MRI, where they look at the brain to see if different parts of the brain are functional and working. And three months into this, or 12 weeks, they actually gave them money as part of the test to see which part of their brain lit up 
and whether it lit up when they actually took that money and gave it to somebody else. So what they found was that the more grateful people based on the scale gave more money of the money they were given, and it was associated with neural sensitivity in a place in the brain called the medial prefrontal cortex, which is where learning and executive function occurs. And they found that those that wrote gratitude letters had even more activity in this area when experiencing gratitude. So even at this point, three months out, this activity where they only did three weeks, three months earlier, had lasting effects on the brain in a significant way. Pretty powerful study. This was not an association study. This was not a case control study. This was not a retrospective. This was a randomized control study. So why, you might be wondering, is this important? Well, it's because these types of feelings actually lead to things that we can measure in terms of cardiac health and other types. Here's a study that was published in 2019, just before the pandemic, titled Positive Psychological Wellbeing and Cardiovascular Disease. This is a Jack Health Promotion Series. And they say here, numerous reviews and meta-analysis have evaluated the role of depression, anxiety, anger, post-traumatic stress disorder, and chronic stress in relation to development of cardiovascular disease. Talk about a number of prospective studies based on almost a million participants with follow-up periods ranging anywhere from 2 to 37 years. And they found that depression consistently predicted excess risk of developing coronary disease. But what we're talking about today is thoughts, which sort of goes along with depression. But specifically, we're talking about anxiety, PTSD, anger, hostility. These are all very similar, and it appears to be at least as potent risk factors for chronic heart disease as depression. And it appears that a combination of these negative factors confers a cumulative risk. We're looking at the positive psychological well-being, and if it's good, it's going to positively impact health behaviors, biological functions, and psychosocial factors and encourage restorative processes. If it's negative, there's going to be deteriorative processes that occur. And of course, stress plays into that as a third party. And overall, where this leads to is positive or negative cardiovascular health as we go later on in life. So it might be beneficial to learn these sorts of things because in contrast to mindfulness interventions, Positive psychology interventions aims to promote optimism, gratitude, something that you might be doing at Thanksgiving, and positive effect directly through activities such as imagining and writing about a better future, recalling positive life events, and identifying and using personal strengths in planning and performing acts of kindness, going on mission trips and helping people, volunteering your time. These can be very straightforward and easy to do. These sorts of things have been found to improve indicators of psychological well-being, such as optimism, in the short term, with some suggestion of sustained effect. Now, there have been a number of meta-analyses done in 39 randomized controlled trials that found that positive psychological interventions were associated with significant small effects on well-being and depression with sustained effects for three to six months at follow-up. This may be one of our major pillars that we really aren't talking about in society. We talk a lot about nutrition, the right dietary supplements. We talk about sleep and rest. We've talked a lot about that here at MedCram and the role of exercise, fresh air, water, sunlight, avoiding toxins. And what we're saying here is that constraining our thoughts to appropriate things may actually be also one of the pillars of optimized health. We sort of referred to this at the beginning in terms of anger and things of that nature. One of the things that has a lot of literature in looking at this is on forgiveness and empathy and understanding. So people who harbor resentment, feelings of anger, this has shown very clearly to promote bad health and specifically cardiovascular disease, particularly in men. I just want to clarify what the science believes that forgiveness is and what it leads to in terms of empathy and understanding. It's more than just moving on. Somebody just kind of shrugs it off and moves on. A little bit more than that. It's not just doing that. What it doesn't mean is that there's no justice. So if somebody does something to you, justice can actually happen, and you can still have forgiveness. What happens outside of you in the justice system is different than what happens internally. So people can have justice, but still not forgive, and vice versa. That's not what we're talking about here. The other thing that it's not is a sign of weakness. You might think that somebody might forgive somebody because they're just not in a position of power to take retribution, so it's just easier to forgive. That's not what we're talking about. Actually, forgiveness is not a sign of weakness. It actually takes a lot of strength to be able to forgive someone and to move on and have empathy and understanding for the very person that may have done something very bad to you. 
it is linked to reduced anxiety, depression, major psychiatric disorders, fewer physical health symptoms, and actually lower mortality. I always hear the expression, what is empathy? It's walking in someone else's shoes. Well, I kind of like the quote from Brene Brown in Atlas of the Heart, where she says this, we need to dispel the myth that empathy is walking in someone else's shoes. Rather than walking in your shoes, I need to learn how to listen to the story you tell about what it's like in your shoes and believe you even when it doesn't match my experiences. I think this is really key. I can think of many examples, even with the recent pandemic, where a lot of us in different walks of life experience the pandemic in completely different ways. My experience in the pandemic was working in an intensive care unit where people all around me were dying. And that's a very different experience from somebody who works out in the business sector, who saw that their jobs basically got shut down and they had no business. And so their view of the pandemic may be completely different than the view that I had of the pandemic. And we have to realize that when we form our opinions, it's based on our experiences. And when people say things that doesn't fit our experience, maybe they aren't coming up with this because they have some agenda or because there's some ulterior motive. It may be because of their experience, and we have to treat that with validity, regardless of what our experiences are. If we really want to have empathy for other people and try to understand them, I think that's important, especially if we're worried about our own health, because this impacts our health when we have anger or resentment towards other people. So this is an interesting study about forgiveness, and this was published back in 2016, and it's titled Forgiveness, Stress, and Health, a five-week dynamic parallel process study. They wanted to see what is the order of events in terms of cause. They say here, we addressed this issue by examining how forgiveness, stress, and mental and physical health symptoms change and relate to one another over five weeks. They hypothesized that increases in state levels of forgiveness would be associated with decreases in perceptions of stress, which would in turn be related to decreases in mental and physical health symptoms. So what they said here is that they believe that forgiveness would lead to a reduction in stress, which would then lead to improvements in health. That may not be completely apparent. They had a interesting way, and I won't get into the details of this, but I will leave a link in the description below so you can read the study for yourself. They wanted to also test, based on the statistics, whether or not it was better health that led to decreased stress, which then led to increased forgiveness. Because we know that forgiveness is linked to better health. We know that. All of the epidemiological studies show that. So health versus forgiveness. But we can't tell which one is coming first. They tried to do that using some sophisticated statistics in this five-week period of time. It could very well be that increased health could take away stress. That seems reasonable. And if you're under less stress, you're more likely to forgive people. So which way is it? So what they did is they recruited a large community-based sample of 332 young, middle-aged, and older adults. And each week for five weeks, participants reported on their levels of state forgiveness, perceived stress, and mental and physical health symptoms. They found that levels of forgiveness, stress, and mental and physical health symptoms each showed significant change and individual variability in change over time. And they used that variability to see if their hypothesis was correct. And they actually hypothesized, let's go back here, that this was not the case, but rather forgiveness leading to improved health. And they said here, as hypothesized, increases in forgiveness were associated with decreases in stress, which in turn related to decreases in mental, but not physical health symptoms. In other words, forgiveness went to stress, went to health. The reverse effects model that better health led to less stress, which improved forgiveness, provided a relatively poorer fit, which means that they believe the first model was correct. Their conclusion was that this study is the first to provide prospective longitudinal evidence showing that greater forgiveness is associated with less stress and in turn better mental health. Strategies for cultivating forgiveness may thus have beneficial effects on stress and health. Let's take a look at whether or not this is true. And to do that, we turn to a pretty old study, 2009, from the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, otherwise known as JAK, titled The Association of Anger and Hostility with Future Coronary Heart Disease, a Meta-Analytic Review of Prospective Evidence. They did a literature search, and they found 290 articles. They did quite a bit of elimination there. There was a lack of suitability of study design or inadequate predictors of outcomes. And they were left with 63. 
And they finally narrowed it down to about 44 studies. And they looked at anger and hostility on heart disease in a healthy population and anger and hostility in heart disease in a diseased population. I thought that was interesting. So here are the results. And I know that this is kind of hard to see, but this top part up here is in the healthy population, and this part down here is in the diseased population. What you're looking at here is a line that goes all the way down and looking at these individual studies. And what they're doing is looking to see whether or not subjects in these studies who had anger and hostility had predictors of heart disease. And so what you can see here is that in the healthy population, the meta-analysis showed generally on the right side of the ledger, which favors less anger and hostility, that showed that the overall was 1.05 to 1.35, which showed that anger and hostility was a risk factor for heart disease. In the disease population, they showed a very similar endpoint as well. And because it did not include the number one, it was statistically significant. You can actually see that here, P equals 0.008, and here P equals 0.002. Regardless of the number of studies here, there was a similar outcome, both in the healthy population and in the disease population. So they said that there was 25 studies or 21 articles investigating heart disease outcomes in initially healthy populations and 19 studies or 18 articles of samples with existing heart disease. Anger and hostility were associated with increased events in the healthy population studies. Here's that hazard ratio, 19% increase. And with poor prognosis in heart disease population studies, and here you can see a 24% increase. There were indications of publication bias, but if you look at the fail-safe numbers, they felt that those numbers were large enough to be able to make that call. Now, intriguingly, they found that this harmful effect of anger was actually greater in men than it is in women. In other words, men were more likely to fall victim to heart disease if they harbored feelings of anger and hostility. So their conclusion was the current review suggests that anger and hostility are associated with heart disease outcomes both in healthy and heart disease populations. Besides conventional physical and pharmacological interventions, this supports the use of psychological management focusing on anger and hostility in the prevention and treatment of heart disease. So all of this led to an article in 2018 in February asking, is forgiveness a public health issue? And you really have to ask that question because let's look at society today. There are a number of stimuli to us all the time, whether it is on television, the stock market, elections that are happening every couple of years, social media. There are agendas. And in some cases, the agendas are designed to make you hostile and angry because anger is a very good motivating factor. So you are motivated to vote for one particular party or another based on the type of things that you watch, regardless of whether it is on one side of the ledger or the other. And what you're left with is just being angry. And the question is, is how is that affecting you? We know that anger is a very motivating factor one of the things that I have noticed personally is I am very wary of anybody who produces any kind of social media content where they are assigning motivation to an individual or a group without knowing that for a fact. I think that's a red flag for me because it doesn't stick to the facts. And we can never really know someone's motivation. You know, generally speaking, to figure out motivation, we need to have a judge and a panel of 12 people. It's very easy to associate motivations, and that can cause people to be quite angry. It affects us sometimes more than it affects them. This is kind of an interesting concept because we spend a lot of time on nutrition because we want to be healthy. We spend a lot of time talking about sleep and rest, about exercise. We even have gyms that we go to to make sure that we're healthy, and we make sure that our air is clean. We go to great lengths to filter our water or buy bottled water to make sure that we're healthy. We're trying to get outside and get some more sunlight. We're avoiding uh, toxins and things like that. We're buying organic this and organic that and making sure that things are BPA-free. But the question is, are we putting enough thought, if you don't mind the pun, in terms of constraining our thoughts? because I believe that this is actually negating a lot of the positive benefits that we might be getting. 
This has been known for a long period of time. This idea of constraining our thoughts to things that are not negative can actually have a tremendous impact on our health. A notable health reformer said, earnest workers have no time for dwelling upon the faults of others. We cannot afford to live on the husks of others' faults or failings. Evil speaking is a twofold curse falling more heavily upon the speaker than upon the hearer. He who scatters the seeds of dissension and strife reaps in his own soul the deadly fruits. The very act of looking for evil in others develops evil in those who look. By dwelling upon the faults of others, we are changed into the same image. And so the question is, is it possible that the benefits of diet and fasting and sleep and sunlight and exercise if we're not careful, could be completely negated by feelings of anger, resentfulness, ungratefulness, unforgiving, and stress, that would certainly be a shame. And I think we should make an extra special effort, especially as I'm recording this here on Thanksgiving week. When we come to Thanksgiving, maybe we should take the name of that holiday a little bit more seriously. Thanksgiving here in the United States is in November, but there are many, many other similar holidays around the world. And so this really is the perennial thing that we shouldn't be just doing once a year, but all the time. And speaking of which, all the time, we at MedCram all the time are up, available, and ready to educate. If you enjoyed this and want to support us, please visit us at medcram.com for the latest continuing medical education and videos. I hope you start to think more positively and dwell less on the negative and perhaps even think about a few people that you might want to write some gratitude letters to or even maybe forgive. Until next time, thanks for joining us.